Maine by Susan T. Landry. I have an epigraph which I will read you. Quit your job, sell your house, rent out your car, lose the spouse. Come walk with us. We're going to Maine. Life is never going to be the same. This is from a handwritten sign on the Appalachian Trail. Uh, it's anonymous. I found it on the internet. Twelve years ago, I moved to South Portland from New York City. Long before that, I had established the intense sort of bond with the state of Maine that a child might imagine with her birth mother, no matter how kind, how lovely her adoptive mother might be. My people, my gene pool folks, tried to stake out a homestead here more than 300 years ago but managed to be annoying enough while living in Saco that they were dispatched to Rockport, Massachusetts. You really can't blame the fed-up indigenous people, stewards of the land, their land, which my, for my forebears rudely claimed as their own. When I became old enough to ask questions about my middle name, my mother told me a vague story about long-ago relatives who had lived in a different town in Massachusetts. The more recent direct maternal lineage, for which I was the sole carrier of the name in my generation, was described summarily, but clearly the shining star was my great-grandfather, David Tar Wadley. He was said to have held a key role in engineering, a critical element of the Boston subway system in the late 1800s. I have been unable to find documentation of this assertion, but it is true that David and his father Joseph of Brighton, Mass, were skilled house builders. The resurrection of the family name in Maine did not take long. By the 1700s, those Tars who'd not been tossed out and those who made their way back without incidents continued to set up stakes in Falmouth, Yarmouth, and Perpudoc, which we now know as South Portland, cultivating an eye for prime real estate. My own first excursion to Maine came some 200 years later, in 1954. I was seven years old. My mother was pregnant, and the polio epidemic was devouring Massachusetts like a voracious and greedy beast, particularly on the South Shore where we lived. My mother's physician urged her to leave the state if possible, to head well away from large residential populations that were fertile vectors. Lucky for us, a couple who were among my parents' closest friends had a cottage in Port Clyde, Maine and so we spent several months in paradise. That summer, and the next, when we returned for a few weeks with my new baby brother, was utopia to me, pure and simple. I did not make it to Maine again for many years, not until I was in college. I remember two brief excursions, both with Danny, before or soon after we got married in the late 1960s, early 70s. The first trip was the two of us and our friend Alan Kaufman. We were stoned for much of the time, and the only flash of memory I have of that adventure revolves around peanut butter and blueberry jam sandwiches and a close call with death. I was in charge of food, and Alan was driving. Danny sat up front next to Alan. We were gaining height near the top of a very steep incline. As the car crested the highest point and bore down the equally steep descent, Alan asked if I could hand him something to eat. He kept his eyes on the road and blindly groped the air for the sandwich I was passing forward. As he grabbed it, the blueberry juices oozed out from between the two slices of bread. Alan looked down at the globs of jam staining his pants, and the car veered wildly to the left, just as a trailer truck appeared out of nowhere in the opposite lane. Danny reached over, clamped down on the sandwich, and tore it out of Alan's grip. The huge truck roared up the hill toward us, and Alan, who'd always had a bit of a death wish and a dark sense of humor, started giggling maniacally. 
Danny yanked the steering wheel sharply to the right. We chimed in with Alan's drug-addled laughter until tears of relief rolled down our cheeks. It was damn close, but we did not die. A few years after that craziness, when we'd settled down in New York City, Danny and I and his college roommate, Pober, made another foray to Maine, or actually through Maine, because the ultimate destination was Quebec City. We also had a small hijacker along for the ride, Danny's and my three-month-old son, Benjamin, or as he was known in those days, Benjabuns. We each had our own mission. Mine was to find the best main baked blueberry pie as we headed north. Pober's was to see a bear. And Danny's was to drive and do his best to ignore the baby's crying. Benjabuns had colic and rarely stopped crying. Don't even bother asking yourself why any sane parents would take a colicky infant on an eight to 10 hour road trip to Quebec. In addition to the obvious task ahead of me, which was to keep the baby either snoozing or nursing, I was also stressing about a wager I'd made with Barry, our downstairs neighbor in the city. He had struggled with weight gain his whole life, most likely because he was literally raised in his family's Jewish deli in Dorchester, Massachusetts. He wanted to drop 50 pounds in one month, and I wanted to shed my extra baby pounds. So I was subsisting on gum, carrot sticks, diet ginger ale, and canned stewed tomatoes. And of course, the baby was draining those calories as quickly as I could replenish them, leaving me a bit strung out. We made it to Canada more or less intact, and with several of our goals checked off. En route, we stopped in Bath, Maine to pee. The tiny downtown restaurant called Betty's that we invaded was featuring freshly baked blueberry pie. It was perfection, so good that it was clear there was no point in comparative sampling, and thus I saved myself from an onslaught of calories. Our, ap ap our appetites and bathroom needs sated, Danny plotted a long but optimistic route from Bath to Baxter State Park and onward to Quebec. In a stunning stroke of luck, which fueled our sense of invincibility, just as we drove slowly through a leafy glen in Baxter, a mother bear and two cubs sauntered across the road. Pober was quietly blissed out until we reached our destination. <clears throat> Going back to New York was such a horror show that I will spare you but for a brief summary. We got lost in a morass of logging roads with very little gas in the tank, and the baby decided that fairly relentless stop-and-go cycles of colic criming were not enough, so he took a noble shot at the world's record for non-stop crying. I met my second husband, Matthew, in Marshfield, Massachusetts, where I'd grown up and where I returned after Benjamin left home for college. I had become reattached to my hometown after spending countless weekends the previous two years shuttling back and forth between New York and New England. First my brother and then my mother died, and I was left utterly depleted as cancer ravaged one and then the other. Being near the ocean and around my brother's friends comforted me, as if by some magical process of my geographic availability, my brother, too, might stop by and visit. So I bought a small cottage walking distance to the beach and packed up and left New York. Although Matthew had grown up in Flushing, Queens, and had lived in Massachusetts for his entire adult life, when he and his siblings were kids, his parents had purchased a sturdy cabin on a large plot of woodland in the small town of Lincolnville Center, Maine. After we began spending time together, he took me to the house in Maine, and we went there often in the spring and summer for the ten years that our marriage endured. Despite our ups and downs, Matthew and I both loved the trails and the woods, 
the rocky coast, the ponds and lakes, and the strong ties held fast between old-time Mainers, the sea, and the land. The next, and perhaps final, chapter of my main saga began with my decision to move back to New York City, and then, after two years of hard work and accruing a nest egg, I forged yet another relocation to live in Maine full-time. Matthew was not pleased with my wanderlust, my demanding job in the city, my insistence on working harder when he had just retired. The marriage ended messily. I bagged my high-end high -end editorial job, sent out emails to everyone I knew, announcing I was available for freelance work, bought a house in South Portland, and headed to the Pine Tree State. The love affair continues to this day, heightened to a level I had not anticipated. I was fortunate to find a delightful man who also ended up in Maine after a series of poor decisions that were remarkably akin to those of my own. In fact, since we have been married and since we moved to Bath, we are both so content to be here that every summer we rent a cottage for a week, a getaway just a three-hour drive down east in the endlessly bewitching state of Maine.